Hi everyone, this is the 25th of February 2023. We are two days into the end of this month. And I, what I really wanted to discuss uh, today is the complete confusion, the chaos, the historical comparisons, conspiracy theory. What do you really make out of you know these things going on today? Uh, can we draw from the past? There are a lot of similarities at the same time there are a lot of differences. The mood in India turning extremely pessimistic at the same time there are clear signs of opportunity. In the US most managers are confused between what looks like a possibly already bottomed out market because of the breadth thrusts and the strength of the underlying and then the fear that recession is coming in the second half of the year and inflation is going to stay around for longer. How do we really put all of this together into our investment thesis? It's been really tough. I have tried to draw uh, you know, comparisons from the past. Uh, I have tried to look at it from so many different angles. My views have changed in the last month or two, uh, you know, rightly or wrongly, because what I thought in December may appear like it's actually playing out. A lot of people have told me, so what you said in December, last chance to sell, market's really falling that way. But what I said in January was, uh, you know, looking at the world markets and everywhere else, things would really rebound and they have. Who thought that Europe would have gone back to an all-time high, you know, or that uh, the Dow would have retraced more than 61% of its entire fall. Uh, and Many and even the Russell, I mean, the broad market, uh, which is basically the small caps, really doing so well in the US. So, all of these things happening simultaneously, uh, and then Indian markets faced uh, what has been uh, a big crisis because while uh, the view was well, if we've you know sort of moved along with the world markets, I think almost since August, even though we may have outperformed. Uh, all our rallies have been in conjunction, which means we've rallied when the US has rallied. Only thing is we went up more and they fell more. And uh, when they were falling, we also fell, but we fell less. And so that way we ended up outperforming, looking like it's decoupling. Uh, but all of a sudden, we're actually looking like decoupled because every other market is going up and ours is not because we had what is now going to be called historically as the Adani crisis, right? How it ends, we still don't know. And so let me start with that. Let me start with this crisis and its historical context and why I focused on it so much, uh, you know, doing a spaces which got people very alarmed, a lot of people telling me, how could you do this? You are someone who looks at things balanced and why was there a, you know, uh, political angle or was there, you know, a biased angle to it? Uh, my only bias was that there are two ways to look at whenever there's an event from a pure technician perspective. One is that have we discounted this news because, you know, a lot of things come and sometimes the bad news is the last news to come. So is this that bad news, the last news as a discounting factor? Or is this the start of a you know new phase in market? So when I started to do that thought, uh, I actually go back to 2001. So for me, everything is history and past. People who've heard me before uh, know that I can actually draw uh, you know all the way back to any event uh, from when I've been watching market since 1990. So as an observer, uh, because after all, it's everything is a behavioral study, right? Why do we get into Elliott wave analysis? It's a behavioral study of mass psychology and so mass psychology is what we observe around us and for years uh, having worked so closely in a place of interest you i've observed everything uh, whether it was as an analyst as a uh, you know anchor as a uh, you know uh, interviewer you know interviewed so many people uh, when i was at the Lal street journal moving into not just the print media but they moved me into other media so I ended up interviewing every other broker through 94, 95. How many, how many people actually remember? So here's a good one that I was remembering yesterday. Reliance Industries was actually banned from trading on the Bombay Stock Exchange for one complete day because of some, uh, uh, you know, something that some wrongdoing they had done. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was spotted. And MG Damani, I think he was then the president. Uh, of the uh, president or direct, yeah, you can call him president of the uh, BSE, uh, among other directors. They always there was a board of directors, and they always choose one as the head. And he was he was he actually took that decision, and you know said, fine, they must be punished. You know, they've done something wrong. And uh, big surprise. I mean, you have a big stock like Reliance, uh, you know, not be allowed to trade for a single day. 
Of course, a month later, he had to step down from his position. Uh, we can all speculate on why that happened. Uh, but these are these are events that have actually happened. So, uh, uh, we look at one event in isolation. Okay, we don't see, we often, all of us don't have a history and context of how corporations have been through the markets, good, bad and ugly. They've all been blamed for different things at different points of time. I've spoken about this maybe in some podcast or uh, you know, earlier video that Reliance itself went through its own uh, phases. Uh, it was also uh, said to be close uh, to governments and, you know, got a lot of policy policies through it. But when I make that comparison, you know, with how the Adani group is growing, I say, okay, once Reliance became big, what it had to do is it had to stand on its own feet, which is raise capital on its own and bring the cost of capital down. Because the moment you become a behemoth, uh, you need to, you know, uh, get economies of scale. That's what you're taught, right? In any MBA school, you you learned about large organizations, economies of scale, focused on, you know, single product line. And that's how you become, uh, you know, cost effective and uh, competitive, right? So then you're able to stand on your feet as, as a large producer. Otherwise, competitors can kill you on price. So how do you get there? So once, when you're actually adding capacity, you need debt, you need capital, you build it up. Once you've reached size, you need to bring the cost of capital down. And I think Reliance has been the master of that. If you see its history and finally they achieved it, uh, they mastered the idea that you need to keep raising equity when the cost of equity is high and re raise debt when the cost of debt is low. And uh, uh, that way, your cost of capital is always down. So they kept doing that through the 1990s and they achieved success at the end of it. But through that time period, a lot of analysts would think, you know, that, you know, this is not a good balance sheet. We can't read it. You know, there, there are people who actually would, would be very negative. Uh, and so, but of course, we didn't have FI. So there was no case for a Heidenberg rep report on, on anything that happened. But there were a lot of group companies. I mean, you've seen uh, companies like RPPL, REL, R two times RPL, you know, there's power, energy, infrastructure. Enterprises, there's so many companies of uh, uh, of the Reliance Group which came and went. Some of them got remerged into the into Reliance industry. Some of them have gone away, delisted. Some are, some then got separated between the two brothers. Then some of them are again gone. <laughs> and there's so much has happened that it's bizarre. But you've had the one big company which is the Reliance Industries always kept standing. So I think the work done by the Rubai Ambani, Mukesh Ambani in terms of managing that organization is what really counts in the end is where everything got clubbed together and that's become the big business in whatever two, three areas that they've uh, been successful at, both in terms of keeping costs low and expanding. So, so one can actually learn it, but it's not an easy path. That's the main point. So here you have another group. Unfortunately, uh, uh, of course, we I don't think, I don't remember a time when RIS, well, you may have had other issues with RL, you wouldn't have had valuation. So I think that was the big issue that this all started with. Now, why am I making historical comparisons? I'm not saying this is okay or that is wrong. I really don't know, right? It is still to be investigated. Uh, I'm just making comparisons uh, uh, without, uh, uh, you know, investigation, just, just on facts that are uh, in place. Uh, so you have someone who's trying to grow uh, many companies coming out of it. Uh, there's capital involved at some point of time. They need to bring the cost of capital down. I think this that's what all this was all about, right? They wanted to raise more equity and then they got into trouble. Uh, how it will end? Will they eventually manage to raise it and bring the ca cost of capital down? If they do, great. If India's interest rate cycle turns, it would help them. So sometimes you get something in your favor which you least expected, which saves you. So there's so many things that can happen in this battlefield uh, that we overlook. Uh, unless you do something completely wrong and then that is picked up on, then, then of course there have been companies in the past and entire groups that have gone down. Uh, so, so, so now let's, let's put this all in context. There are two comparisons I can make here. One is of, you know, companies that have gone down. Okay. So if you think of, think of just the period, if you go back really to previous bubbles, you know, when we think of 2000, when we think of 1992, what used to happen then is, uh, you know, markets would rally strong, hard mid caps and all kinds of stocks. And then every in every downturn, there would be some group or some, uh, you know, particular uh, sector that would get caught up on the way down and then I unwind. And so that would be the relatable news that, okay, this went down with this cycle, you know, so it was tech stocks and then there were the K10 stocks or the I stocks and they all went down with the 
tech bubble or 92 it was amazda and various groups re- related to harshad mehta that went down but they also survivors in that like there are some companies that survived 1992 like acc which was also among harshad mehta's large holdings but it survived and remained a good company z survived this cycle though it's gotten into debt and other issues right now there are many others which have come and gone so the many so there will always be uh, the winners and losers but wherever there has been losers whenever the cycle has peaked and the losers have declined everything has fallen and there's been an 80% 90% loss in the companies that were in bubbles versus other stocks also falling simultaneously and retracing 50 60 70% of their gains in that time period so that's how bubbles have ended historically but when we went into say the late uh, you know 2010s uh, and i started to see the same kind of thing and i wrote a lot about it whether it was in the uh, infrastructure uh, sector power uh, then it started to appear in most of the uh, uh, rdag group companies then it was the psu banks uh, so i wrote about psu banks and the excessive debt in our system uh and all of those views that i wrote about which are lot of which are published after 2013 everything is published on india charts uh all of those started to play out but even though you saw psu banks lose 80% or you saw rdi group lose 80% and many other individual stocks from yes bank to even ilfs and other uh, nbfcs lose through that entire debt cycle the nifty this time did not crash it didn't collapse and this was a this was something new because every time in the past we've seen such collapses in entire sector such unwinds in uh, credit you actually seen the entire market come down and the only thing which brought it down was actually covid which was an external event which was a global event uh, and so unless you get a global event uh, which is either uh, the likes of covid or what could be next is would it be war so you had russia last year but it's not become a global war so it's things like that or 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 a global credit bubble you know like like you had with the housing bubble which ended up being global because uh, those uh, uh, you know bonds were sold to everybody around the world so in in that kind of an environment uh, you would actually end up in what we've come to know as a major uh, sell off which is across the board where everything you know starts to fall together but unless that happens what we are not seeing is uh, a major decline in markets if certain sectors are hit certain groups are hit rest of the market continued to grow uh, based on whatever growth was there in some other sectors you know so there was always something else supporting the market and it went on that's the first time we saw it between 2016 to 2020 and uh, therefore it was something new it can look like it was a one off uh, but here as we enter 2021 2022 and it looked like uh, we had the end of something similar Uh, to the tech bubble because that's what it was being called initially uh, when us tech stock started to sell off it looked like yes we are ending a second tech bubble this is equal into y2k and valuations were high now they are all falling apart these stocks are uh, you know extremely expensive the big difference though between y2k and now i'm not saying that there weren't you know companies that were getting listed at least in india yes there were new age companies getting listed at crazy valuations and many p ratios were high uh, but at the same time uh, in the us the tech stocks this time were actually profitable companies it was not like you know uh, cats.com or something this is not this was not that happening it was not amazon.com still waiting to make a profit in y2k but this was amazon.com which is like a multi billion dollar company today so the issue really was one of valuations you had the first interest rate spike so actually this was a bond bear market more than an equity bear market and in this bond bear market because you had a huge spike in interest rates that was the real issue and when interest rates go up what happens to valuations even if you have profitable companies if you are pricing them here because interest rates are near zero moment you take interest rates here the valuation normal comes down here even if the profitability is constant this is the first variable okay so the first variable is just if you are adjusting to rates the real question is are you really popping a bubble so one year down the line uh, we are still trying to draw comparisons and then adani happens in india so So when Adani happens, I start drawing parallels of okay, how was the Y2K bubble versus the India bubble in 2000, and how is it happening today? The closest comparison is so between uh, you know 2000 and 2001, uh, the tech bubble popped, US stock Nasdaq was falling, the Sensex and uh, Nifty were also falling. Uh, then I was watching more of Sensex than Nifty, so Sensex was falling, let's say. 
So when the Nasdaq was falling, of course there was a mild, there were many bounces and bear market rallies as there are retracing 50% of the fall and then falling again to new lows and that went on and went on and went on. It went on till October of uh, 2001 and then Indian market looked a bit oversold and started to rally back. Uh, I was then with a different firm prior to uh, the one I am at now, uh, at, uh, you know, before Sher Khan. Uh, uh, so now, of course, I'm in, uh, I'm on my own. But before this, it was Sher Khan. Before that, it was a company known as Sanwa Finance. And there, my outlook was that, you know, October 01 to maybe Feb, there could be a rally. And the reason was not just that it's oversold, but there's the seasonal cycle between then and the budget. So I just thought maybe the seasonal cycle plays out. It was a wild guess, as we call intuition, and it actually worked. But the fact is that rally was again a bear market rally because it was corrective in nature. It had extremely high value, volumes, more volumes than you had at the peak of the tech bubble in terms of you even look at the Sensex chart today, you'll see this big volume run like this uh, around that time period. And the reason is this, that even though a lot of stocks in the tech sector like Infi, Satyam, the main ones that actually come off, uh, many of the uh, you know speculative stocks, uh, whether it's Himachal or even uh, those which were doing business in the tech like NIIT, they'd fallen, but they kept bouncing back significantly, uh, even though to lower highs, but in, in a broad range. And so they'd sort of created a shelf support, like a neckline, as we call it. And they were bouncing off that again and again and again, and not really breaking below that. This went on till this period in uh, you know March of 2001. And it's actually then, which is halfway through this Y2K bear market. And while this bounce was happening between October uh, of uh, 2000 and March of uh, 2001. Uh, so yeah, it's not October 2001. It's Ma October 2000 and March of 2001. So between that, when it was bouncing, the Nasdaq was still continuously falling. So basically India decoupled. It looked like decoupling from the world bouncing back. But because the Y2K bear market was still in force, our decoupling was temporary. And eventually we joined the US on the way down. And that joining on the down actually involved the popping or breaking down or distribution ending for all of these companies. So in that fall, which started from February of 2001 into March of 2001, you suddenly saw all these stocks lose 80 to 90% within months. Okay. Whether it's NIT, DSQ, Silverline, Himachal, Global, Tele, GTL, all these companies. Of course, that doesn't mean Infi, Satyam and all didn't fall. Even the big caps fell. But the others which were, you know, trying to hold on in a higher range as if they are, they are also, you know, normal big companies just consolidating. They finally broke down from their bubbles, many of them, super high PE ratio, no business companies doing very little business and they, they just cracked and went uh, straight down within months. But being that it was a Y2K bubble still unwinding, the Nasdaq was still falling. Our decoupling became recoupling and then we fell along with the US market. Now, why am I giving this story? Because for some time I have kept trying to compare, is this the same pattern that we are following? I kept looking at the US market, okay, it's fallen, maybe this is wave A, you will get a counter trend bounce and you will fall again. That's what I thought in October, I thought in December, I said India is decoupling, but it will recouple. So it's a bear market rally. And when US goes into wave C down, it, everything will fall together. Today, we are asking the question, has that started to happen? Because you are suddenly seeing the US market fall again in the last few weeks after you know going to a certain retracement and not being able to cross its 20 month average. And so we are asking that question again, bond yields are again rising, dollars are again rising, are we going into the next phase? The difference is that in 2001, the Nasdaq never bounced so much, it just kept falling when India was de trying to decouple. Whereas in this scenario, uh, here, uh, India has actually bounced back. And now when India is falling, the globe has bounced back and Europe has gone to a new all time high. Asian markets which were falling one way have rebounded pretty sharply. Some of them close to highs. Nikkei has not fallen so much. So the big difference now, we are more than a year into this, okay, more than a year into this bear market. And except for US markets being down, maybe still more than 20% for the NASDAQ, many other markets are not down like that. They are not like doing what they were doing in 2000, not even India. India made an all-time high in December, one year down the line, which was not the case. March of 2001, we were still at a retracement of the last fall in that bear market. You know, so uh, so there's this big disparity. So despite all the similarities, it started like a tech sell-off, a valuation correction maybe, but it looked like, okay, it's, it's the bubble. So people started calling it the bubble and everything bubble is unwinding. Everything's falling apart from Bitcoin to tech to whatever it is. And everything should have been taken down in the same way. But 12 months, more than 12 months down the line, everything is not down in the same way. And so now this should make you question and what is, 
while the similarities are there, what are the differences? Now, what is the last similarity? And it is the Adani group, right? So you always had some group, okay, linked to some operator or something happening. At that time, it was whatever, K10, so K10 Parik, I don't know. If some These are market rumors. Somebody has to prove that he is involved in, in this group as well. Uh, I don't know. That's what the, the Heidenberg report also tried to point towards. It has been a market rumor for long. The things cannot be known till they are known. Uh, but the point is that, yes, definitely overvalued and was holding on for longer. And if you asked me in November, December, I would have said the same thing that it is the last thing, which last shoe that has to drop just in similarity to 2001. In fact, I've already written, written those case similarities uh, on, on the site and you know discussed it in various Weekend with India Charts episodes that this is how it happened. Is it the same thing? Uh, in fact, Palak Shah was in my spaces. I asked him the same thing in December. I said, uh, you know, who will be the next one to write a negative report on Adani? I actually told him that. So I'm telling you guys, when I told him, I said, you know, why don't you do something on that? Because he's a he's an investigative journalist. Aren't you able to investigate something is wrong here when this looks so overvalued to everybody? The story he did much a month later, which he did the spaces on, was a different one where he was trying to investigate the short seller, right? You know, what is his case? You know, is that a real case or not? Or is there something wrong there? But something wrong there doesn't mean something is right here. This is how most people interpreted the spaces and started to badmouth it, which is fine. So that's your opinion. But uh, but I was telling in the scene, I was saying, can't you find something is wrong here? I mean, this thing is just holding on for long and this is December. Right, because Adani Enterprises are still making a new all-time high on the 21st of December, and the Nifty was falling three weeks after I wrote the last chance to sell report. So I was really boggled. I mean, this is still not happening. If it had to mimic 2001, this is what should happen. Uh, you know, everything which is still overvalued should fall and catch up. By the end of Jan, that's what started to happen. But by that time, I thought maybe it's not happening, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I should be bullish. So I actually changed my view. But this st starts happening. Now I start thinking that this is happening, okay, but the Nifty is still not below the June low. Even though the Adani group is down now by 60, 70, 80% in terms of the individual stocks. Now this is really bizarre. Now this is going to the next bizarre, okay, because now this is even more not comparable with 2001 because then it did break uh, the October low, October 2000 low. It rallied till March and then when the unwind in K10 stocks happened, you broke the uh, previous low. But we haven't done it yet. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. You can say that. But question is, you have not done it yet, despite such a big collapse happening. And why hasn't it happened? And what is Europe doing at an all-time high? And so now if you start asking these other questions, fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of people say, look at the chart, don't talk about macro. But that is the only answer. How will you answer something like this? Why is it Europe set a new high? Because even when US was raising rates, okay, in the face of this whole inflation problem, Europe was printing money. All the way till June, ECB was buying bonds, even though inflation was 6, 7, 8. And then finally, they said, okay, we need to raise rates. And then inflation went to 10 and they are still raising rates. But they are raising rates, they are like at 2, 3 percent. Before they get to 4 and 5, like, you are still at huge 7, I don't know, 700 basis points, negative real interest rates. And that's just if you believe as, we, as, as the conspiracy theorists say, believe the official numbers. Let's believe them for the timing. Let me not be the conspiracy theorist. But even then, with the real reported numbers, you're at a negative real interest rate on US. You're at a negative real interest rate for Europe. And that is partly the reason why markets are elevated. If you really wanted to be Walker, you'd be raising rates like way above inflation rate. You're doing it slowly. You're doing it slowly, hoping that will cool down and you won't have to do too much. And therefore, you're keeping it negative. And when you keep it negative, you provide a flow to the market. That's happened in Japan. It's happened in Europe. And really speaking, that's what happened even in India because we kept liquidity high. We were slow in raising rates. The Nifty has bounced back and gone to an all-time high. Sales for autos were still high even when market was falling in, you know, April to June. The auto sector was going up continuously against the market. So this has been a phase which is so different from 2000. It's not like everything collapsing, but it is like one sector is correcting, but something else is doing well. So if tech is falling, autos are doing well. But in 2001, everything was going up, autos were not doing well because COVID is there, demand is not enough. And then when the demand for everything else, start, when everything got overpriced, 
then auto demand came up and suddenly autos are doing well and then hospitality is doing well and then itc is doing well but and coal india is doing and then suddenly all the psu stocks because value versus growth is doing well <laughs> and so all this rotation has helped that some sectors are collapsing others are going up then others are falling others are going up and therefore the nifty which should have hit 12000 based on all these stocks that have fallen did not do so because one fell the other went up and then the other fell then the other went up and so they kept rebalancing each other and the nifty is at a higher level so this is what has happened in india around the world it has been support from central banks japan is still buying bonds even though ecb has stopped temporarily uh, but uh, their rates are still far below inflation rates and so indirectly or directly we are providing liquidity keeping liquidity high supporting the markets and so if this is so different from the year 2000 where the, all this intervention in central bank activity was not there then can we look at the market in the same framework you know and then what is it that central banks really want don't they want inflation so yes uh, that is where the whole uh, story goes eventually when you have a situation of high debt uh, you have only two options uh, default or inflation but inflation at a rate that is bearable and interest rates at a level which is below inflation this is what this is what the modern monetary theory uh, from the international bank of settlements suggested in uh, 2017 18 uh, it was not being implemented then because of course it also requires as part of the thesis government spending covid provided that opportunity unfortunately it led to excessive spending and that is why you have excessive inflation the object therefore has to be to bring this down to a level where it's bearable but it's not that you want while they are talking of 2% inflation or zero you wanted less than 2 that's not going to solve the problem okay uh, so why is europe keeping uh, interest rate so far be- behind inflation because they need that they need to bring their debt levels down they've been consolidating the economy for almost 20 years okay so if you look at it you haven't made a new all time high in the euro stocks 50 index for 20 years similarly like japan from 1998 all the way to 2010 2015 no new all time high and then suddenly from there japan is now in a new bull market it hasn't made a new low since and same way same thing is now maybe i'm just theorizing probably happening in europe it's been through a long consolidation phase the post covid rally actually looks like a first and second wave pullback and so for all you know it's starting a third on government support and inflation so they are inflating their debt away uh and that is what central banks really and us will probably be the last one so maybe they are doing it in rotation see central banks are working in unison they are not working separately there was a interview of uh, you know jeremy powell right after the last uh, you know policy meeting uh and in that interview he was asked you know do you talk to other central banks and he said yeah we we are speaking to each other talking about what we are doing so clearly what we would think Uh, what i have been thinking for a long time that this is all coordinated action where europe plays you know d- moves in a certain direction then us in a certain direction then japan in a certain direction they don't move in the same direction at the same time and the reason is obvious because if they all did say so for example they all tightened at the same time then you would really have a global collapse so they all do different policies i tighten a bit you easy then you easy then me tight and so us was doing qe nobody else was doing anything when the us stopped stopped doing qe2 ecb started to do qe1 and then japan came in later and then they were weakening their currency so the dollar went up because they were weakening their currency is not because the dollar was getting stronger this is 2013 14 15 16 story so all of these things have happened and they've been doing this all along which is coordinating one way then the other way one way then the other way i do it first then you do it later when you're doing it i won't do it and so back and forth so the currency market remains stable and there's no excessive volatility so they've been managing the situation for more than a decade in this in this uh, format and they also doing that right now they need inflation but they don't need too much of it and they are coordinating back and forth each one is trying to so if they are really working to keep inflation going but at the same time not keeping it too high then inflation is a bullish force for equities it's not a bearish force and that is why there will always be a floor so understanding what they are doing so it really takes me back to the only guy who's most hawkish is us fed right they're still saying we'll keep it higher for longer we'll we don't mind if the economy weakens blah 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 does the market believe what they're doing so last year i also thought okay don't fight the fed he's saying so he wants to collapse everything let's remain bearish but the fact is moment the market start to re- to reverse from december onwards and because they created excess liquidity from october onwards 
then are they doing what they are saying becomes a big question mark. And so you have to look at the market to judge what does the market think. Because everybody is confused. If you listen to YouTube videos, you listen to hedge fund managers, you listen to all of them, all these guys, they all confused. They don't know. They can see that the market's recovering. Uh, the technicians can see that there are breath thrusts uh, happening in US equities, which have only happened after market's bottom. So there are such readings which are which all indicate the bottom is already in. But when you look at the, you know, fundamental side and think, oh, but they are going to keep rates higher, we'll get a recession, earnings will slow down, then they all scared the market will crash. So there's this two countervailing forces. The technical is telling you the worst is over because the Fed is pumping money, maybe. And the fundamental is saying that, no, the worst is not over. And so everybody is confused on this fact. And because people are confused on this fact, they cannot really come up with a 100% conclusion, you know. And so where are we going to get that conclusion? From the markets themselves. This whole idea, this inflation thematic, okay, is the only answer. Because at the end, are they all going to default on their debt? If the answer is no, then they have to inflate it away. And if they have to inflate it away, then the only thing they're trying to do is cool inflation down without breaking anything, okay, and then letting it persist at some rate. And if that is true, then the markets are not going to collapse. And because you had rotational movement in India, we haven't seen a steep correction. We would have all liked it. I would have liked it go down to 13,000. Very good opportunity. But stocks have done so one at a time. And therefore, the opportunity at a stock level has come in some cases even gone because PSU stocks are not going to be available at the levels they were in probably June. And so uh, whatever may be happening right now short term, which is bothering us, okay, uh, will this translate into a maximum fear thesis. Give it a few days. I'm not saying I'm not saying go 100%. But my thoughts are telling me this is not going on. May not go all the way. Okay. Uh, yes, bond yields are rising again. Dollar is rising again over the last 10 days and creating fear. But is this going to result in a major US collapse? Is like a big question mark. Nobody has the answer. And so unless we really get a confirmation that another sell-off has started in the US. Okay. And this is like a breakdown which nobody is going to save right that's the answer then yes then everything falls apart then there's no choice but here we are at the end of a crisis period and everything is looking very different as it has in any other previous crisis period and that doesn't make sense and that's similar to 2018 and the only thing which made it happen was 2020 when covid hit so unless there's some major external event and the only other external event can be war so if something happens on the russia china side yes then that could be the external event that breaks this down. But if that doesn't happen until the point that doesn't happen, markets may just remain elevated because of the inflation thematic remaining persistent. So this is my overall thought. Uh, the comparisons are, you know, are they going to play out? They should have. I mean, the, with the Adani thing happening, if it was similar to Y2K March 2001, the market kept falling till October 2001. Okay. But if that is the case, everything should be falling apart. But simultaneously, while you can have some stocks that look expensive, you have others like today I was just looking at Tata Power in May of 22, P ratio was 50 times. Today, what is it? 21 times. Earnings grew, right? So some places earnings have grown and suddenly valuations are not that high. So it's, and then some things have already fallen, which are not doing well. So there has been huge rotation. Okay. And uh, we have to really look at uh, this entire event in the context of this, uh, this rotation. And therefore, I just can't take one side or the other. Surely anything's possible. But I can't, I'm not able to take that the same stance I would have taken probably 20 years ago because things, while the similarities and events are there, uh, the, there's so many things which are, which are not the same. The market's own behavior is not the same anymore. You know, this is not how markets were one year down the line. You didn't have you know, the world markets recovering one year after the Y2K bubble, it was still collapsing. And if we were going to, de are we recoupling on the way down? Are we going to recouple on the way up? This is like the real question. I think we are sitting on the cusp of that answer. Probably next few days we'll get it because either US markets have started the next leg down, in which case we just join it and go all the way down. But if it's not the case and you see stability, okay, US indices have already corrected last few days. And if you see stability, bond deals again flatten out uh, because inflation is going to cool off in the second half of the year as expected. And if you have high inflation in the US, okay, it's not just about commodity prices or oil prices, it's price of everything, including wages. 
So labor costs are going up, people are getting more money, they are able to spend more, prices have gone up and they are getting more, so they are able to spend more and same in India also will happen as increments happen through the March, April season, people get higher salaries and suddenly the higher interest rates become manageable and then the whole equation changes and this is how it is working, so therefore it is incrementally moving ahead at a higher price level and things are working at a higher price level, it is not like the higher price level is causing a collapse, which is the opposite theory, that theory exists, people are saying that these higher prices will cause people spending to fall and earnings will collapse. But on the other hand, they are not just spending, but prices are high and revenues are moving up. Okay, So which one is true? You really need to get your head right on which of these two are true. Don't go by what I am saying also, go check it out, figure it out on your own because both narratives are out there, people saying no, 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 it is a bubble end of the world, conspiracy theorists have been saying it for 15 years, so don't listen to that. Okay, get your real answer. Is inflation really percolating to a point where wages are able to support higher prices? If not fully, at least to some extent, I am not saying fully, nothing happens fully. But is it like a complete collapse of the situation, which is what is being told? May not be the case. And unless it is, then we are, you know, overpricing the downside. So what can happen in the interim is, I do expect that US markets will underperform, which means they don't run away to all time highs. They could be in a range, they could move up more slowly. So it will be more like 2003 to 2008, what happened? US markets didn't perform. NASDAQ didn't even make a new all time high in 2008. Okay. But uh, emerging markets, world equities, everything did very well, much better than, than the NASDAQ and, and the S&P did better. But uh, of course you had the housing bubble, but it didn't like run away. Okay. So it, it did better, it got back to the highs and then you had the second sell-off. So will the second sell-off which people are anticipating happen tomorrow or is it that second sell-off one year away, you know, after something breaks because of high interest rates because that breaking point is also important. The 2007-8 crisis happened after the US started raising rates, after they had cut it, after Y2K, they started raising rates again. 2006-7, the subprime crisis already had happened. Market still went up after that because they were not sure whether it's a crisis. This time around, interest rates have been rising in the US for quite some time. Nothing has broken it. Nothing has been announced as broken. You had a guilt crisis in UK, bailed out. Oh, it's not there anymore. Something has to break which is large enough that cannot be contained or requires much more work. And that is when everything falls apart. Okay. And uh, uh, unless, of course, the Fed says, I'm crazy, I need to kill the economy, <laughs> which they are saying, but they may not do. Okay, if they had to, they should have been doing that. It should have been working that way. Market doesn't believe they are doing that. Okay, I'm saying that. I'm not saying they are not saying. They are saying, but the market doesn't believe them because they've pumped in some liquidity here and other central banks are pumping in something there. And so there's this disbelief. So we need to be very careful about how this plays out. Okay, it's not a certainty it's going to play out this way or that way. So we take it one step at a time, one leg at a time. Each time there's a risk, we mitigate it. But uh, uh, look for that big thing. If you see that big thing, then definitely that will tell you when things are going to, uh, you know, break. But till you can't see it, we might just end up being early on that call of things breaking down. And that is that is the risk of being too bearish here also because negativity is actually high. Everybody is pessimistic. Pessimistic as hell. In India, though, definitely everybody is scared. Scared as hell. So I've given you a context, historical comparisons, what has happened to different groups in the past, how they have played out in the end, uh, you know, even those which were pointed out to go through the toughest of times and who were probably pointed to you know, doing things that are not right, eventually made it through uh, because that's how it is. Business is tough. At the same time, there can be some that actually fall under. There have been a lot of cases of companies that have you know gone down and not recovered. We don't know what will be the case with this current, uh, current group. But how I relate with it is not the current group. I relate with what is the event and what is the event in the past? How did the market react to it? How is it reacting now? Where are we in the cycle? That is what I am really trying to get at. And uh, things are very, very different here than where, where they were in 2001. And so this difference is really keeping us on our toes. Uh, we are trying to make that judgment call. Uh, is the worst over? Uh, possibly we are close. I mean, here's the last thing I'll leave you with. Uh, when the top occurred in October of 2001 and we have started this corrective phase, once I acknowledged that fine, this is a longer bear market. I said bear markets in India typically last 12 to 18 months. That's the average. Okay. Some have gone to 21. But uh, so if I took 18 months, I said fine from October 2001, March 2023. Okay. So that was my, and it's there. It's published in many of my reports, this timeline. March 2023 is here. It's next month. 
So are we now there almost in the last part of this cycle, last part of the selling based on whatever has happened with Adani, you know, how much ever you want to want to sell it down, sell it down. But uh, is that going to be the final uh, buying opportunity as, as this, you know, bear phase, uh, if not price wise, time wise, price wise in stocks, but time wise in the index is coming to a close. So, so that's, I think, the last thing to really think about. So I'll leave you with that. A lot of thoughts, a lot of inputs. Uh, think is what I'm really pushing you to do rather than saying, you know, I've told you what I think, but think, think for yourself. Now think about all these factors and you might get answers. Uh, specifically, I think the inflation one I've pushed you hard. Is it really something that's percolating and becoming part? Are prices higher to stay here or are prices here to go down? I think they are to stay here. Okay, so so the way the negative uh, business models are, they say, oh, if inflation comes down, earnings go down. No, inflation is coming down on base effects. Prices are going to stay here only. This is something I said on the spaces of CNBC one year ago when Prashant was, you know, holding it and I was still bullish. I was saying, what if inflation just stays here and the base effects kick in and six months down the line, inflation is back to zero and then they're all happy. That's sort of what, what is happening right now. Prices are not going down. They're just staying where they are. Okay, and they're not going to go down. They're here to stay at this level. Then the question is, will they rise from here again and push up inflation rate? That is a separate question. So uh, if they stay here, they do, that doesn't have a negative impact on, on earning, on revenue at least. Earnings depend, depend on margins. But then if you get, uh, and then that's down to whether, whether wages are also rising enough to support people's consumption theme. And if they are, and there are savings supporting it, then that goes on, which is what you're seeing. You know, you, What was the fear last night for US markets? It was uh consumption right consumption data the pc data came in and that was showing that uh they are still consuming you know people are still consuming not slowed down <laughs> is that bad or is that good <laughs> you know and in terms of at least earnings it may be bad for interest rates but is it good for earnings or bad for earnings so i think think about it i'll leave you with this today thank you very much mm -hmm.